I had this crazy thing. Um, Sean Doherty. Sean Doherty, yeah. Yeah, Doherty. Yep. Sean called me, and we were doing this interview, and it was right before Pipe. And I'm sitting in L.A., and you know how bright it is in L.A. in the sky? You don't see any stars or anything. And he's interviewing me and Mick in the lead-up to, to the Pipe contest and the world title. And he says to me, what do you think is going to happen at Pipe? And I just, like, I was so excited. I was, I was so ready for Pipe that year. And as I started to say the first word, a huge shooting star went across the sky. Wow. Like at San Pedro, Long Beach. <laughs> just like, just over the coast. Jeez. Like the brightest one I've ever seen in my whole life. Like, I, it looked like a firework. Like hmm. it exploded. And I went, Sean, you're not going to believe what just happened as I started to answer. He's like, what? And I go, this shooting star. I go, as you asked me, what's going to happen at Pipeline? A freaking shooting star. I'm like, if that's not some kind of... <laughs> universal message yeah i'm like i don't know what's i go something fucking special is going to happen at pipeline that was kelly slater i'm jamie brissick you're listening to soundings brought to you by the surfers journal the surfers journal is a reader supported publication Made possible by sponsorship from Birdwell, FCS, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, Visla, and Yeti. More book than magazine, it delivers 120 pages of independent storytelling in each issue, covering the people, culture, travel, and art of surfing. Members receive the magazine six times yearly, in addition to an unlimited access to the magazine's archives, discounts in its store, plus subscriber-only access to additional digital content, exclusive film screenings, and sponsor offers. To subscribe, please visit surfersjournal.com. So Kelly Slater, 11-time world champ. So much to say, but, you know, Kelly probably needs the least amount of introduction uh, out of all the guests we would have on this show. I will say that I first saw him surf when he was about 12. It was a contest at Huntington Beach, the World Team Trials. He was tiny. Uh, He rode a Matt Keckley board. He was sponsored by Sundeck. And the whole beach was just cheering for this this super grommet. Um, and we've spent a lot of time together over the years. And I've done many, many interviews with him. And we, I, I think I could call him a friend. Um, important to note, I did this podcast at Kelly's beachfront home on the North Shore. It was four or five days before the start of the Pipeline Masters. And it was just before his 50th birthday. So what you're hearing here is a guy who has yet to win this big milestone event, and he's thinking about it. So, Kelly, 11-time world champion. Uh, I I knew you before this, but the first time I really got to know you probably was 1992. You came to stay with me, my then-girlfriend, and and our roommate in Sydney, Australia, in Newport Beach. Mm. Now we're sitting here on the North Shore 30 years later. 11 world titles. I guess the question... 30 years this month since I stayed with you guys. Incredible. <laughs> that was January. Yeah. That's cool. You have a good memory. <laughs> and you won the Pro Junior. I did. Yeah, Shane Doran and I made the final there. That's actually a good story we could jump into. But um, yeah, that was a really great memory and a, a, a real good start to my first year, um, first full year on tour. That's here. Oh, well, uh, that, I didn't ever win the World Junior. I really wanted to win the World Junior. I surfed it in 86. I failed to make the team in 88, which I, I just, uh, someone just sent me um, an interview with me from around that time. And I should have made the team, but there was a strange way they did the points because of my age. Because I was younger, I got 500 less points going into this trials to make the world team. Hmm. And because of that, I missed by a couple hundred points, but I should have been on that team and I didn't make it. So it was really heartbreaking to not make the Puerto Rico 88 world amateur champs mm-hmm. i tried in 1990 in japan i got fifth place and then i was going to turn pro and um it was that was one of those things before the isa games they had the world amateurs and it was just amateurs no pros in it and all that kind of thing and it was it was a real honor to serve for your country and make that team in the first place but it was a big thing leading into your professional jump was to try and win the world amateurs Funny enough, the only person that ever really made a huge mark after winning the World Amateurs was Curran. Hmm. Poto also won it, okay. but there was a the there was a it. bunch of guys. There was a, there was quite a few guys that won the World Amateurs that never really went on to do much professionally, which is an odd thing. Hmm. But I didn't win that, and so it was a little bit of a chink in the armor. 
so to speak, just before turning pro for contract negotiations and all that stuff. So Shane Doran and myself, Ross Williams, of, of, I think it was the three of us, maybe one or two other Americans flew down to surf the pro junior in, in January of 92. I was 19 years old, just about to turn 20 and embark on my first full year on the world tour. And um, it was just a big goal. I thought this is the last, this is the last sort of amateurish thing I can do. It was called the pro junior, but I, there were amateurs and pros. I, th I believe you just had to be under 20 basically to be in the event and no American had ever won it. So it was a big goal of mine to try to go down there and beat the Aussies. Mm -hmm. Shane Doran and I made the final. We were best buddies. Um, we were, you know, staying out down there together, surfing together and everything with Ross. And we, we made the final and that was the event. It was hot, sponsored by Hot Buttered and Terry Fitzgerald ran the thing. Okay. Contest director. It was like sort of his brainchild. And in the final, Shane and I were so excited that we said, hey, why don't we go first on the first wave? Why don't we go switch foot? I remember this. I do remember this. Yeah. And so we, we both went switch foot on our first wave. And as the Aussies would say, Terry Fitzgerald thought we were taking the piss. Uh -huh. He thought we were like putting the middle finger up to all the Aussies like, ha ha, laughing at you. Right. And, and he thought we were going to surf the whole heat switch foot. And I, from... From the accounts I heard, he was gonna, he was about to run down the beach and swim out and start trying to drown us. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. And, you know, we were just really doing it as a celebration. We didn't have a thought in our mind like, you know, fuck these guys or anything. It was just, it was really just like, we're so stoked. We thought one of us going to win. We're going to be happy for each other. Mm -hmm. Let's celebrate it. Right. And so that was really the only thing in, the mind, in our minds. But, you know, Aussies, uh, especially back then, were a bit cocky and brash. And there was a lot of, between the Aussies and Americans, there was a lot of tension. Yeah. The Aki current thing. And yep. it was just a real competitive thing all the time. Mm -hmm. And so they thought that we were just being assholes. And uh -huh. we weren't. We, yeah. we were just having fun. And so the intention for Shane and I, and, and if you watch heats of Sh Mine and Shane, every heat we've had except for one since then, we went switchfoot on the first wave. What, what a great, what a great way to bond with a friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you won that. I think you won the world title that year. I did. And then you, you've won many, many world titles, many, many uh, world tour events. I guess um, thinking in a, in the big picture, does does all the success make life easier? I don't know. I don't know how you answer that because you would have a completely different life. I think mindset is what makes life easier. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's some achievement. Yeah, um, it, that's easy to say when you've achieved a lot. You know what I mean? It's well, that's a that's a thing where people go, "Oh yeah, well you've won that," so it's easy to say that. But I, I think what makes life uh, easy is just being um, being satisfied and being happy. Yeah, and um, obviously there's things that come along with success that make life easier. Like having money, having outlets for things, having a network of people around the world, things like that, that that have been really great for my life and in some ways have made my life easier than other people in my family. Mm -hmm. it also, it's also made my life, life really complex in some ways that is really hard to keep up with. Um, and uh, it's almost like this constant ride I'm on and I'm trying to maintain it or yeah. something, you know? And so... Um, I'm starting to feel that change and um, maybe my, my life normalize a bit now. I've been traveling less. Mm -hmm. lot, you know, I've basically been in segments of three months everywhere I've gone for the past couple of years. Yeah. Um, bar two or three quick trips. But um, normally it's, it could be three days in Australia, a week in Fiji, fly back through Oz, repack my bags and go to Indo. From Indo go on to you know compete in Brazil or whatever. So it's it's just nonstop. Like the adrenaline is just constantly fueling my life mm. uh, up until these past two years with COVID and um but, and in a lot of ways, obviously COVID has been terrible for a lot of people. In a lot of ways, it's been really good for me personally because of the slowdown and having to kind of confront and look at things in life that maybe you can just sweep under the rug Yes. while you, you know, I got to go, I got a flight to catch. I can't talk. The, you know, the, the world tour is so like that. I mean, yeah. I, I yeah. Uh, having, having done my five years on it, I think back to that time and I was really just, I was able to sort of ditch out on a lot of responsibility, you mm. know? Um, yeah. Nor you know, normal life responsibility, but then you have other responsibilities that fill that, you know, if you're a sponsored guy and you got, things you got to do in that realm yeah but um 
as as for normal life and family and all that kind of stuff, it definitely is a change to living in one town all the time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So, what's the greatest buzz in your life now? Lately, it's been a lot of golf, <laughs> and um, uh, this certain body work I've been doing with a couple guys in California, stretching and and massage work and stuff. Um, this guy I've been working with, his name's Glenn Calkins, and he just gets this group of a couple friends together every Saturday in San Clemente. And I was there for a few months, so I was doing it quite a bit every week that I could. In fact, if I was out of town, it was really like bumming me out. I wanted to be back in California to, to do this. But this guy has been sober now for about 20 years. And he said when he was 49, 50 years old, he couldn't touch his toes. And now he can do like any kind of split. He can go from standing on his hands straight into a handstand and all the way back down. Hmm. His flexibility and strength is pretty wild to see for somebody who just kind of figured it out on their own. Uh, I don't know. I just get inspired by people like that. You know, I get yeah. inspired by people who who have a certain way they live and then they completely change it. You know, yes. maybe somebody who's been obese and got super in shape. Yeah. Um, somebody who's been a drug addict and got sober. Somebody who's, you know, been a, a victim of whatever in their lifetime and then got their way out of it and, and helped other people. Yeah. Uh, those kind of things inspire me more than more than pretty much anything else yeah i mean i love seeing a big giant barrel get made or a crazy drop at jaws or something you know but it's Mm -hmm. that that's not like a life change that's like a that's like an like a a motivation to get out there and do something but the the inspiration in life for me is seeing those things even if it's something i haven't personally been through just relating to someone's hardships they've had and and them overcoming them yeah no it's an interesting one because i think i've i've you and i both have observed enough um decades of pro surfing to see how sometimes the pro surfing life and great success in that life can almost be a curse uh mm. when you try to stop you know um there yeah. the, it's it's that sort of adrenaline junkie or whatever kind of like dopamine rushes are so high yeah. that to try to step back into civilian life as rabbit bartholomew calls it which is a perfect uh term can be so difficult to what what for the other what for the average person would be a satisfying life if you've if you've had these highs if you've won these events if you've been sort of carried you know chaired up the beach and won multiple world titles it's sort of like where do you continue that where do you find those things um, later and you've been incredible in you know extending the shelf life or the longevity of a of a pro career mm. and I think the the thing that I see is if you you just have to keep pushing, it seems. You know, you, you have mm-hmm. to sort of never stop exploring, and you seem to be doing a lot of that. Yeah, I think you have to be open-minded to change. Um, in terms of surfing, it's it's board design, it's the approach to a wave, you know, judging criteria's change and all that kind of stuff, and the maneuvers obviously are evolving to a, a different thing, and what's expected and understood on a wave is a lot different now than it was when I got on tour, but... In saying that, I got on tour and, and I've said it many times before that I was almost appalled by the level of surfing on tour on average. I didn't think it was very good mm-hmm. when I got on tour. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I spent so much time as a kid mind surfing and there, was a, there were a few guys that I felt like could do no wrong, you know, namely Curran. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But then at, in, in brief moments, Potts and Aki and Tom Carroll. But I still felt like all of them had limited um ability above the lip um with throwing the tail out and that kind of stuff so even though they were my heroes and my they planted all the seeds i had in my brain um and going back to buttons and um in, in some ways i feel like some of the surfing buttons did in the 70s and maybe into the early 80s was more advanced mm-hmm, than mm-hmm. stuff that was in night in 90 yeah um at least you could see it in his mind. His equipment probably held him back from what he could have done. Yeah. The single fins were um, yeah. not really catering to where surfing could go. Mm-hmm. But now I see surfing as, look, there's guys, I don't even know their names that are doing stuff that I can't do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, they're pulling off some crazy air or charging some psycho barrel or whatever. And so there's so much depth to where surfing is. And that makes me really happy to see um just to see the level have advanced that far Mm -hmm. over this amount of time Mm -hmm. the thing that's interesting about the sort of trajectory of being and you and i have a similar one which is you're a young kid you're really into surfing you're competing you're winning events you have these heroes you want to get on tour you sort of follow this path and then you get there and the thing that was always 
stunning for me was there were times when I was in heats against the very people whose pictures were on my bedroom wall at home. You know, that you sort of land with your heroes and there's the thing of, oh, they're my heroes, but I'm actually competing against them now. Mm. You having won so many world titles and dominated for so long, <laughs> where did you look for inspiration? When you're the best surfer in the world by a, a large margin, how do you advance? Because so, the, for most mortals, it's sort of looking at their favorite surfer, right? But when you're that, when you're that surfer, Mm. and you're at the top of your game and you're as you say you're looking around going i'm not hugely inspired by the surfers i'm i'm surrounded by who yeah. are the best surfers in the world yeah. is it is it laying in bed at night imagining where to go next is it looking at other sports yeah i think it's all those things i was i was hugely inspired by guys like, like lance armstrong and tiger woods and michael jordan and mm -hmm. um you know the best of the best in those sports michael phelps and that's kind of cliche to say you know, but they were the best for a reason. Mm -hmm. And they had a certain mindset. They probably had a certain way that they were, they, they probably, a, a, all of them have a, a certain physical gift for the sport they do, a deeper understanding of it than probably all the other people that are doing it, what it takes to do that. And some kind of probably like a chip on their shoulder, some some deeper reason that they wanted to succeed yeah. and, um, and wouldn't take no for an answer. Yep. And I think that comes from a, a dynamic combination of the way you're raised, your, your family dynamics, whether you do or don't have siblings, where you fit in within that sibling thing. You're, you're, um, maybe some of the good and traumatic experiences you had as a child, um, the way your brain works, all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think the more that you can utilize your mind to soak in and sponge those ideas from other people, um, even if they're not doing the thing that you do, you can get in that mindset. You can almost feel what they're thinking. Right. It, yep. You can channel that. Yep. And for me, that was, uh, I think that that's been a big part of my success to, to kind of delve into the idea, the feeling maybe someone else is having and not seeing something as it is what it is. Like you, 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 you and it can't be something else. You have to, have this idea that there can be some other way something can be done or what is the next step in that chain of events or evolution of that skill. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, sometimes that comes from other sports. Sometimes that can come from some just watching somebody who's maybe they're not great at that thing, but they, they're, they're attempting something like a, uh, I was surfing Holly Eva a couple of days ago and Luke Swanson paddled up to me and he said, he goes, you know, when people like, like there's a clip of Griffin a couple of days ago who did it. Griffin does it a lot. He goes, you know that front side turn where people come up and kind of hit the lip and then slide the tail out and then get get kind of stuck at the, not stuck at the top, but stay at the top and then you drop back in and you have all that speed. He goes, do you ever see anybody do that backside? He goes, I never seen anyone do that backside. And he's a goofy footer. Mm -hmm. And so I think he was trying to figure out how to do it at Haleiwa. Yep. Because the right wave at Haleiwa doesn't run off on you. It's on shoulders and, and it's steep, but lots of speed. And I was like, I don't know, you should make that your signature move, hmm. you know, but I guess what I'm getting at is he was seeing something no one else is seeing yeah. or that's, that he's not seeing anyone do. Right. And that's a kind of curious mind you have to have to, who was it, MR or Curran? I remember as a kid hearing one of them say, take what someone else is doing and, and do it your own way, you know, because mm. they can't do it the way you can do it. And if you're going to try and do it the way they do, you're just a second class version of their attempt at that you know yeah yeah yeah. and so it's certain body styles certain ways people understand how to ride a wave the way your stance is the width of your stance um the way you you drop either shoulder the where your balance goes where your weight goes into the rails and forward and backwards all those things are different for each person mm -hmm. and you can kind of emulate and learn from what other people are doing but the way you do it is different from someone else. There's people that surf more forward on their board and don't step all the way on the tail pad, yeah, you know, all yeah, the way sure. back behind the fins. But, and then there's some guys who do. So try the thing you're not doing and you're going to start to learn different lines that you've never done before. Yep. And I, I think I learned a lot of that, a lot of, a lot of stuff from watching Dane Reynolds over the years. Cause mm -hmm. Dane really steps way, way back. Yeah. That's stomp on his, on his stomp. Yeah. Yeah. Like super far back. And, um, I never tended to, you know, be, probably because I watched so much Curran and Carol and those guys growing up. Mm -hmm. And then I had a little bit of Potter in there, you know. Right, right. <laughs> like, so I set back a little bit. Yeah. But um, 
those, yeah, you, uh, and and riding different equipment's good. Body surfing is good. A kid a kid messaged me online today, and he said, hey, "You know, how do you deal?" He, he's asking me about a wave I put on my stories. It's this really gnarly wave um, that if you fall, there's, it's pretty consequential because it's shallow. And he says, "How do you deal with that?" And I said, "One good thing is just to go body surf a lot, and you understand the flow of the wave mm-hmm. and the energy, yeah. and where when the wave's breaking, where all the energy is, and how to put yourself in a place that's safe, mm-hmm. even though it's going to all be violent in there." Yep. When you do other forms of wave riding, whether it's um, riding a blow up mat or body surfing or trying alternative equipment, all those things teach you different ways to understand the wave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when you when you have that, and that's so second nature to you, you don't think about you know you pull into a gnarly section and you're not thinking about uh, uh, you're going to get hurt. You're just reacting. If you do fall, you're just reacting to where do I got to go? Mm-hmm. How do I got to position my body? Where do I got to lean my shoulder or dive my head into the wave or put my arms? <clears throat> All those things to avoid disaster, to avoid getting injured. Or I might get injured, but I'll le- alleviate the worst one. I'm not going to land head first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And understand where the bottom is. And yeah. So the more you roll around in waves as a kid and just body surfing and screwing around with your friends and... Um, you know, riding doubles and, you know, doing yeah. slightly dangerous stuff, but that's fun with your friends. You just learn. Yeah, I see that with John John and Jamie O'Brien, who grew up on the beach here. And yeah. I always think, you know, they, they went from sort of building sandcastles to yeah. frolicking in the shore break to riding pipeline. And Mason. Yeah, you know? exactly, yeah. And um, and Mike Stewart. Yes. And uh, yeah. Cunningham. Yeah. You know, I, so I, I learn a lot just watching people. Mm-hmm. And if you can channel it and feel it, I used to sit on the beach and watch waves and I used to imagine the line you could draw and I used to feel it in my body. So it it starts to wake your nervous system up. It starts to kind of fire the sequencing in your body the way it needs to. Your brain's already ready for it Mm -hmm. when you go and do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's what, you know, the mind surfing is uh, imagining in your brain. Yep. If you reflect on your career, is there, is there a moment, an event, a year that stands out and, and um, one that you feel like, everything came together you were in that groove more than ever um competitively 96 just mentally emotionally and physically everything coming together almost sort of perfectly 2008 probably mm-hmm. i think i won like four of the first five events or something and i thought i was going to wrap the title up like with like three or four events to go but i wasn't even stressed about it i was just I was just so in the flow of what I was doing at the time. My boards seemed to match the wave perfectly. I was always picking the right waves. I was happy, you know, at, and that's that's where mindset comes in, you know, mm-hmm. just being happy and content. Mm-hmm. When, you, when you have no fear of losing, you know, as you get to be an older competitor, there's always that fear that some guy who's not worthy or he hasn't put in his time or you don't have the respect for is going to come beat you and put you out the pasture, you know? Sure. And so... Th- that comes into heats if you're if you're not prepared mentally. I remember Potts and a few of the commentators always saying, "You know, Kelly's lost a lot of low seeds before." Well, I always fucking surf against the low seeds, dude. Yeah. I'm gonna lose sometimes. Sure, he's susceptible. Well, that's because every single contest I got the lowest seed, and yeah, sometimes yeah, yeah. that's scary because yeah, you show up against like Manoa or Bruno Santos. One of those guys beat me that year at um, Chopu. One mm-hmm. year at Chopu, and they were. The reason I brought them up is because they were both wild cards in that event and they got first and second. Mm -hmm. And then Johnny Boy beat me here in 97. He won the contest. He was the low seed. Uh Um, I was a high seed. Um, There's been a a number of times that happens over the years. I was just talking about how Nicky Wood at 16, Richard Marsh at 17 made the final at Bells and beat everybody as wild cards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, did you, I guess that leads to the next question, which would be having one, you know, several world titles into your career did it ever feel like there's this almost res- liability responsibility that comes with it where i've done so well the o- basically the only way to go from here is down because you're winning you've already won multiple world titles um yeah yeah there's no there's no place up above that yeah so yeah so it's that's a and, pressure and of I, I think i learned a good thing listening to tiger uh because tiger talked about he always trained like he was second place mm-hmm and so he had oh, to imagine. He had to imagine what's first place. To, what's that guy doing? Yeah, but if you're the best at something, 
you're not the best at everything. You're you're the best at putting that whole package together. Yeah. You're not the best at tube riding and errors and cutbacks and bottom turns and reading the waves and picking the right waves and planning out a heat and and you're not you're not the best at all those things. Mm -hmm. So what you're what you're trying to be is the best at the grouping of all those things mm -hmm. when you're a competitor. Yeah. So um, and and all the things that feed that you know having the right mindset, having the right support around you. Um, alleviating the stress, mm -hmm. uh, being, being ready on the day you have to compete, yep. you know, physically and mentally, um, diet, it all fits into the puzzle. Yeah. Yeah. In order to try and go out and win. And then, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's beyond a person and, and it just comes from somewhere else. And what pops into my mind is my 18th birthday when I'm watching Buster Douglas beat Mike Tyson and Buster Douglas's mom had just passed away like two weeks before. Mm -hmm. And at some point, somebody just decides, I'm going to fucking do this, you know? Yes. And nothing's going to stop me. Yeah. And and the, you can say all you want about like Tyson didn't train enough and he was partying and staying up late and blah, blah. And that might all be true. But that all lined up because that person's destiny was before them. And yeah. they, but they had to make it happen. For sure. You know, you got into this a little bit earlier, but. I remember at one point when I was on tour, Derek Hine was my coach and Derek coined the term bastard desire. And I remember having a talk with Derek one time and he said, you know, Jamie, you're just, you're too nice a guy to, you're, 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 you yeah. don't, you don't have that thing. Um, <laughs> and I think when and he, I, he probably didn't, he didn't say that in a hateful way, even though Derek had no problem ever being, uh, creating friction with somebody by mm -hmm. the way he asked or said something. Yeah. He's always wanted to kind of dig and pull the bandaid off. Absolutely. But he also had, there's a kindness in Derek that has always presented things that I'm going to give you a little clue and it's, it might piss you off a little bit, but at the same time, if you use it right, it might help you. And yes. Derek was really good at that. For sure he was. And it pissed me off that he said that to me. And, <laughs> and, and, but I, but I do really think back and I did have a lot of desire and actually I, I kind of would argue with him, but on the other hand, he was right. But in any case, in your, in your situation, was there something there that was your, he was right. You're, on? you're too nice and you're not weird enough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it. You know, <laughs> like, like Curran was super nice, but he's weird. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, um, Potts wasn't super nice. And Barton didn't give a shit what people thought, you know, and I, I look at these guys who've won different world titles. I think Tom, Tom Carroll, bless his heart, was maybe a little too nice and he probably could have done better um, because he was he was just so good. Yeah. But I guess there's well, there's niceness in terms of like your 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 how polite you are with people. But there's I guess what. I read that's Derek's. a different thing. It's a thing yeah. like, are you satisfied in yourself? And I think sometimes being unsatisfied can can add to the hunger that totally. creates the bastard totally, desire. Totally, man. What was that? I was, was the most insecure fucking brat when I was a kid. Yeah. So where did your bastard <laughs> desire come from? What was it? I, uh, I and I, you know, I, I still am. I'm still petty. You know, I, it's just I was I was raised in a family with three boys and basically by a single mom who didn't have much and she was depressed all the time and crying and we couldn't rely on my dad and and all those things formed a certain thing in me you know my my older brother sean who you know sean was really like undisciplined with everything mm -hmm. he just he had a little bit of it in his teenage years he kind of went to karate and started working out and he wanted to be a pro surfer and, and you know he got sidetracked and started started enjoying his life too much you know Started, started having a little too much fun. And mm -hmm. that takes away from that discipline. But I think more so, like, it, it forms in the early years, you know? It really does. I think by the, there's a saying, show me the boy at eight, I'll show you the man at 20, mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I think in the first couple, few years, maybe when you're um, in the womb, th there's already a certain, like, energy surrounding your life, surrounding your parents, surrounding your mom. Mm -hmm. um, my, I know my mom had to be just living on crazy stress hormones all the time. The whole time I was in the womb, I'm sure. And my both, all my brothers, my mom's lived that way. You know, she's, she's been real tough on herself and she's been really um, unsure of what the future holds. And they had a lot of financial struggles. And, um, but as a kid, you know, in a, in a, in a household where you have um, alcoholism and then all the things that come from that, uh, it's it's hard to 
just come out of that and be stable and not have some weird shit in your life. Yeah. <laughs> I had an older brother who was, you know, I looked up to, but he was kind of mean to me, but I hung out with him and his friends. So I had to kind of keep up with them. I had to ride the bike as fast as them. I had to be able to play football as hard as them. Mm -hmm. I had to be able to, mm -hmm. to be tough. Yeah. And so there was a toughness about me. Um, I had, I actually used to get in a lot of fights when I was a kid. And then I had a, I had a big personality change probably when my parents split up. I feel like I became a lot more quiet and introverted. But I watched Sean get in a lot of trouble. Like he didn't get expelled from school, but he would get detentions all the time or suspensions or he would just get enough of a good grade to get by in a class. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't, it, it didn't matter to him if it was an A or a D. Mm -hmm. It was a D is passing, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how it looked to me. And I know that it upset my mom. So I, f I felt a, a, a real obligation to be disciplined and do well yeah to make her f less stressed yep and i i really um i hated homework i hated i didn't like school very much i but what i liked about school was i knew i had this friend group that i grew up with they didn't surf they didn't know anything about my surfing as i as i got to that but i went to preschool with these guys i went to kindergarten and for two years with all my best friends um i graduated with them mm -hmm. and then at that point i thought okay i'm gonna become an adult now i left Cocoa beach and i turned pro july 3rd 1990 and uh um did and you, i started traveling the world did you know there was this kind of epic odyssey awaiting you i mean when you were in high school in 10th 11th grade whatever did, were you did you think i have a big life ahead of me i felt like i did because a couple things happened when I was in high school where like certain people started to kind of take notice of me and do interviews with me, um, even outside of surfing. So I saw, I thought there was, there was something kind of happening here, you know, mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. it got, you know, th certain, some things were like, whoa, what's going on here? Like I, I was in People Magazine mm -hmm. and um, at 18, I was still in high school. I remember doing that photo shoot. I had to go find a, I was trying to find a place where I could go and do the shoot, but hide so no one would see me because I was embarrassed. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. But um, I, I always felt like I could, if I could think of, if I could envision, I could do it. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. There was a quote that always stayed with me from uh, from one of the probably mid to late 80s uh, surfing magazines, and it was Shane Horan, and he said, winning is a way of getting rid of problems. And it, mm. and I and I at when I was at that time I had a lot of problems in my life and it was almost as if focus on um, competition was a way to escape and evade those other parts of my personality. But yeah. it, for you, I also I also think that's an easy way to kind of like explain away because that is your life at that time. That is your life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's what your focus needs to be on. Mm -hmm. And there's no reason to feel guilty that something else feels left in the trail, uh -huh. you know, because that's what you had to do to make that your life and yeah. your reality. Yeah. And I had, I've struggled with that a lot in the past because I've, I've always felt sort of guilty for everything. The way I was raised, I was, I felt really guilty about everything in my life about, you know, not being home or I, I don't know, just all sorts of things. I, I, sometimes I feel guilty for winning heats when somebody else needed the money, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but uh, there was a deeper part of me saying, fuck that guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Because I had that. Thing. Yeah. You know, I had that, like, I am I am nice on the outside, but I had that thing on the inside where there's no way somebody's beating me. Mm -hmm. And that's just how I approach things. And I'm a lot more lenient about that now. When I'm in the moment, I get into it, but I don't live and die by the sword now, you know, with competition. Mm -hmm. um, You're less competitive, anyway. would you say? I'm probably less competitive now. Yeah. I, I more enjoy, I more want to, display my surfing you know i think that's a a thing for a, the artistic side of a surfer is you know i like the platform i guess of competition mm -hmm. and dane talked about that a lot and dane uh reynolds he talked about that a lot in his surfing like he did like that platform because he can show people what he's been working on but he's also like a small town kid and he didn't really care about that so much but yeah. so if i can put my very best surfing together and that can inspire someone or make them stoked they saw that, then I did my job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you want to do now? You're about to turn 50. You know, a year ago, I was like, what do I do for my 50th? And I was going to either buy, I was thinking about buying a boat as my retirement. And 
just going off into the Western Pacific and finding waves that no one's at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but uh, then I just didn't feel satisfied with um, the past year. You know, I was I injured myself right before Australia last year. Had to skip that. Um, still been in a pretty good for performance for the events I did. I got a third, fifth, and ninth, I think. And so it was like not a bad year. I requalified on three events. Um, didn't have to go for that injury wild card, which sort of just became my end of the year goal. Mm -hmm. If I can get to Mexico and get a ninth, I'm in sort of thing. But I felt like I was able to go there and just surf pretty free. I wasn't too caught up in my head about that. Yep. Um, and uh, I, it, it felt nice because when you compete and all your friends and people you know around the world get to see you surf and then they send you texts and, oh, you, you know, either – Oh, you shouldn't have caught that wave or God, that was great to watch. Whatever it's going to be, you get all this feedback. And um, at that particular event in Mexico this year, I got a lot of really good feedback from people um, that my boards look good, that my surfing looked clean, that I looked really fast and powerful and blah, blah. So I was like, okay, I'm still, I'm still there. And I didn't, I didn't feel like I ever kicked into gear in that event. Mm -hmm. I was just kind of showing like I can turn it on when I need to. And then you know, we went to Trestles and I, I was able to do commentary for that final event. And it was just great to watch that level of Gabe and and uh, Italo and Felipe, mm -hmm. especially. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Connor and Morgan were there, but, you know, they and, and uh, you know, Connor surfed really well that day. But overall, those obviously those other three guys just they step away from the pack. Yeah. And it's a it's too bad John wasn't there because that was some real nice big open face carve yeah. stuff and that came together yeah yeah do you want to win more events i want to win pipe i want to win chopu for sure mm -hmm. those are the events i focus on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to me those are the important events mm -hmm. um if i'm gonna pick one I, if i had to pick one event to win i would win the final at wherever it's going to be this year yeah <laughs> and yeah. win the world title and walk off you know yeah but uh um and and Look, if that's not in your mind when you join, when you're on this tour, get mm -hmm. off the tour. Yeah. If you don't want to win the world title, if you don't think that there's a possibility that you can win a world title at some point, yep. What are you doing here? You're listening to Soundings with Jamie Brissick. This podcast and the Surfer's Journal are made possible due to TSJ's subscribing members and through the sponsorship of Birdwell, FCS, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, Visla, and Yeti. To learn more about the Surfer's Journal and its sponsors, or to subscribe, visit surfersjournal.com. Now back to our guest, Kelly Slater. So you've worked on yourself a lot over these last few years. And I, I, I'm curious about that because I know there's a way in which I think winning contests and being a pro athlete, you work on yourself in so many ways on the physical level, mentally. Um, but there are spiritual things, I suppose. And there are things yeah. that just sort of happen in midlife, ways in which we need to grow. It's funny. I'm pretty open about my life. I'm pretty open about my personal battles and, you know, journey and stuff, because I think, I think that doing that helps other people feel like someone else is going through it because sometimes sure. people even your close friends won't really talk about some gnarly stuff they've been through mm -hmm. and um and it all comes out in your relationships you know and Kalani and i've been through a lot we've been together a long time and we, we went through some really really hard stuff last year that i didn't think we we're going to get through mm -hmm. and i had to be honest and um with myself and and with her, and I think with honesty, with like just raw honesty with a person, true vulnerability with another person is the deepest form of cleansing you can do. Mm. And, uh, and someone who loves you, someone who can um, accept that you fuck up yeah. and that you're not perfect. And instead of using it against you, they realize you know, if you have somebody who really loves you, I think they realize that it reveals the parts of them that are dishonest too, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. either with themselves or with you or or with someone else. It, you know, it can be big or small, but when you go through a cleansing like that, for me, that's what opens up your my mind and my like my neural pathways and and 
Right. When you get vulnerable with something and honest, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. there's just no quicker way to your core. Yeah. And and look, there are things that facilitate that. You know, you can get a psychologist, you can do plant medicine, you can you can go do hypnosis and uh, you know, psychotherapy and all that stuff. Um <clears throat> And, you know, for a time, I'm sure there's people who have had success using antidepressants to get through a tough period where they felt suicidal, those kind of things. Yeah. Um, But having someone that can accept you for you at your rawest form is probably the the deepest form of healing you can have, Mm -hmm. in Mm -hmm. my opinion. Yeah. It's interesting because it's an entirely different kind of growth than the growth that comes from winning events, you know, or, or diving deep into. You, oh, know, you don't grow when you win events. Yeah, it could, it <laughs> no, ar- you it get arrests. stuck in the bar all night buying drinks for people. No, yeah, just no, but it does. <laughs> no, but there is that thing where I think a lot of there are great athletes who they're sort of um, they they end up arrested because they excel in one place, but they're deficient in another. I guess. Yeah. If you were to think back on your career, obviously, like tons of natural talent, but is there any? Is there any sort of, of all the ingredients that make a great athlete, is there anything that you feel like you did the best, um, whether it's the hard work physically? Obviously, I'm w- looking at your diet, and, and you're, you've worked incredibly hard on Oh, these 30 vitamins i got to take this morning. <laughs> <laughs> but, you, you know, they're, you, if, they're all, obviously, they're all, it's a holistic, integrated thing, but there's also, like, you could, you could also, you know, separate, like, there's the mental work that you do. Is there something you, you feel like that I've really done well, aside from just being hugely gifted as an athlete? Mm. I feel like I've done my best to be mindful of of other people. And when you do that and you make friendships around the world, like the, the one thing that stands out to me about my life, like if I meet somebody and they're getting into surfing, like um, I got this friend named Hugh Evans. He started Global Citizen. Mm-hmm does those big concerts with Beyonce and Rihanna. And um, I met him in Italy a few years ago and he was, um, he wanted to come here and go surfing. And so instantly, I wasn't gonna be here, but I instantly made a couple phone calls, um, texted a couple people. I said this, you know, I need somebody to look out for this guy. And I had it set up, ready to go. And then he actually transitioned and went to went to Costa Rica instead. Mm-hmm. And, um, he set his own thing up before he didn't know I was going to, it was like somebody else said, Hey, I talked to Hugh and he wants to, so I set it up and then I contacted him and he goes, Oh, I'm, I'm going to Costa Rica. I already set something up. The reason I said that is because, um, I've told people and I told him, I said, look, next time you go surfing anywhere, just tell me I got friends everywhere. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. that's the great thing about surfing, yeah. you know, on the, any, any coast in the world. I think that's a, why I feel like this, this is a big family is, I just really feel like I could show up at any beach in the world. I'm going to know somebody or they're going to know me. And if I was down and out and lost my wallet and didn't have a phone, I could sleep on a couch. Yeah. And that's a great, I don't know. I don't know if golf's that same way or not, or football or soccer, maybe soccer with all the fans around the world. Yeah. But surfing has this network and it's really fun to view the world as my home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but making those connections, you know, the first time I came to Hawaii when I was 12 years old and I met Shane and Brock and Chesser and that whole crew, Ronald Hill and the Kaolanas and, yep. and blah, blah, blah. Just the list goes on and on. Cause that competition, everyone was there and we, I became friends with all those guys. And that, I would say that's my favorite trip in my life. Cause it really changed my direction in life. Mm-hmm. I won the U S amateur, but I also, um, made lifelong friends and I, I ended up staying at the Hills house for years and Brock was giving us shit and taking yep. us, making us go surf big waves and schooling us about everything it is to be an alpha man. I and, remember that. Those days. And, uh, um, so I, I think, you know, just making friends, yeah. making friends around the world. And, um, look, I got friends that are on every side of every spectrum that exists from clean, sober guys that have never touched a, drop of alcohol to like recovering addicts that are horrible, you know, mm-hmm. to, uh, to far right and far left politics to, yeah. to, um, you know, people who f- think the earth is flat to, um, you know, 
scientists. I've, you know, I've been to New York and did Neil deGrasse Tyson's show. It, it just, it's been such a fun experience mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, to be exposed to so many things in life because essentially I was good at something and I was nice to people. And I think friends, I, that's like the, my most valuable asset. Yeah. I really, um, yeah, I, I'm amazed at how many good people are around me. And I'm also amazed at how inspired I am. And I continue to be inspired. And I'm 55 now and I still am constantly learning. And I think as, an, as, a, as a kid who was, my dream was to be a pro surfer and I was a pro surfer and my career ended at age 25. So I had to kind of go to like uh, my second act. Um, and I found writing and journalism and that kept me in the surf world in many ways. Mm. Um, and I'm amazed at how much I keep learning. And I also, I, there was a point where I think I was, um, I was worried that my body was, my, my athleticism, my physical prowess was going to, it was going to be diminishing returns, right? Like it's like my surfing is just going to get worse. And I, at, at, I was I, literally going to ask you that if you still could, if you still think your best surf days could be ahead of you. I don't think they are for me. Uh-huh. I definitely think like I actually, Why? Um, I don't have the, I, because I spend my days reading and writing and that's my focus. Uh-huh. And I take care of my body and I'm still in so my body. So that's more important to you now. Definitely. I had to make, I had to like declare my major at one point. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was hard. And I, and I still love surfing so much. But um, what if you were to take a month? What if you did like one month a year? This would be actually an interesting uh, exercise, you know? Take one month a year and have a goal. Yeah. Like, I want to do this at the end of a month. Like you'll just surf throughout the year anyways. Yeah. But you have one month a year, like in the summer or something, I'm going to go on a trip and I'm going to, I'm going to get X, Y, Z surfboard designs, yeah. you know, three yeah. board designs. I'm going to work on this certain maneuver or, or like putting a whole wave together. It'd be kind of fun to see if you, if you could have something like that where you, cause I really look forward to, um, and I don't think it's just like a denial thing. Um, I really look forward to still my best surf days being ahead of me. Yeah, and I think, and and I think I think when you take care of your body, yeah, and if you have a goal in mind, yes, whatever it is, I'm going to watch these videos. I'm going to go try and do that maneuver. Yes, or um, you know maybe that could it could be that simple. Yeah, I'm going to go try to do this one air. Yeah, you know. Yeah, no, I think that's valid, and I think I think for you that 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 works for sure. For me, at some point, I think when my I, you know I didn't I didn't. Um, I never made the top 16 or the top 30. Mm. So I feel like I had a great run and I'm so grateful for five years of traveling around the world and meeting great people like yourself. But I, it was sort of, I found, I've found more fulfillment in the work I do now. And, and mm-hmm. as a result, I've, whatever, I've, maybe it's my own self delusion, but I've told myself I'm less competitive now. So mm. I think like in a crowded lineup, I just don't, I'm not, I'm not going for the alpha spot to where I was. I'm, ca- I'm catching the scraps and it's, yeah. it's a less fulfilling thing. I noticed that with myself too. There's a lot of days I look at back door and I'm like, man, how many years would I be the first guy out and the guy out the longest ev- all day looking mm-hmm. for that best wave? And, uh, yeah. and now I don't, I definitely don't have that same desire. It's mostly because of the crowd. Mm-hmm. Mostly, like, it's just ridiculous at this point. But if but, you go, if it's a good day at Pipe, like it was a couple of days ago, mm-hmm. and you paddle out, don't, aren't you, aren't you like a kingpin in the lineup, so to speak? It's not exactly that way. You know, when you, when you were doing your thing, that was real clear. There were certain guys, that, bang, it was them, you know? And, yeah. and there are, there's a pack that you can be in out there, but it's, it's not like you just turn and everyone stops, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. Um, m- maybe... Maybe when I'm 60, I can really pull that card on that crew out there, but not right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. I'm still competitive with them. Yeah. And so there's that thing, but, um, and there's so many guys who want it and there's that wave of the winner thing. And there's, um, you know, this ongoing, uh, Vance triple crown, like uh, virtual, virtual triple crown where everyone's out there trying to get their best wave. And yep. it's just, it's so competitive with, at the time when the waves are the best that I just don't have, I don't have that thing in me still. Yeah. Interesting. So I'll, I'll choose lesser ways for fewer people i definitely have matured to a place where enjoyment is just above the quality of or the intensity of the wave Mm -hmm, right now mm -hmm. i still do really like that i really love when pipes good during the the contest Mm -hmm. and um i was a little bit jealous i didn't enter the 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 um, shootout this year in fact i wasn't sure whether i could because of the tour stuff but um I'm sure that in all the years after I retire, 
as long as I can, I'll be putting a team in or I'll jump on a team with somebody to go yeah. surf that. Cause yeah. Hey, why wouldn't you for, you know, four different hours out of pipe with three friends? Yes. Um, yeah. but yeah, look, there's nothing better in the world to me than just a way that scares the absolute shit out of you and mm -hmm. challenges every bit of your ability mm -hmm. to be in the right spot. And, yeah. and, uh, you know, with that, that lurking danger, it's, there's something really fun and exciting about it. And you can't, get it any other way mm -hmm. there's no mm -hmm. other way that i know in, on earth to get that same intensity and excitement yeah and um and personal fulfillment you know it's a sure. short short yeah it was a short-lived thing but when you look back you know there's a wave i got out here two or two winners ago in the pipe contest that was you know one of the best pipe, one of the best backdoor ways i'll ever get and i love how many people have uh, enjoyed that ride, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, and I look back mm -hmm. and I go, man, I got that. That was cool. Mm -hmm, that was like, mm -hmm. that was one of those times in my life there. I got a wave like that when I was 19, the first year I surfed the triple crown and at pipe. Um, I got one where I fell out of the sky and I don't know how I made the way. still like, I look at it now. I'm like, I don't know how I made that. I, I shouldn't have landed on my board when I hit the bottom. Yeah. When I did my heels exactly in the spot on the rail, the turn, the lip just trimmed my head and it, and it exploded so gnarly. I don't know how I came out of the barrel, but it blew me out. And I yeah. was like, I'm, well, I made it. And um, I still think that was probably the most insane pipe wave I've ever had. Mm. And I didn't get a 10 on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I remember Larry Haynes going, oh, my God. He was in the channel. He was filming it from the water. And he's uh -huh. like, that was, in what the hell? Yeah. And uh, I was kind of in shock. Like, really, I didn't know what I had just done. I didn't know what the wave had just done. Mm -hmm. And I was, I guess I was trying to process it in real time but larry was like that was fucking insane and just like losing it and, yeah. I, and I was like it, it was it was pretty cool huh because what happened i was in a heat with glenn winton and simon law and maybe damien hardman or matt hoy i forget one other person and they had all caught waves there's a quarterfinal heat in the morning and the swell was just rising over it was like a swell doubling over the pre previous swell and so it was like there was a big interval and a sort of sm short interval and these things were real lumpy and the beach was steep. You know, December, a lot of times you get that backwash. Yep. And there was this backwash with a new swell and it was probably like kind of a lowish tide. And and I thought, I just need to get a wave and get myself in the heat. Mm -hmm. So I'm at least within one wave of, you know, getting the score at the end. And I moved kind of over to the channel and this thing lumped up. And to me, it looked like about a six footer, five footer. It didn't look like a very big wave, but there was this whole meat behind it and the double up. And as I stood up, it just lurched and a backwash hit it and it hit the double up as it hit the shallowest part of the mm -hmm. reef. And all those things came together and it just free fell. And my heel just hit the, the the inside rail and it just put me in the perfect spot. And all I did was just kind of fall left. Wow. And um, I didn't realize till I saw it on video how intense, like if, if the lip hit me, I'm sure I would have been in the hospital mm. or would have killed me or just broken uh -huh. something, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and I had that stuff in my mind as a kid of like, Chris Lundy and Beaver Massfeller and sure, guys who've been injured those. out there. Yep. So there was that all that intensity. And when when I when I rode that wave and made it, it was like a life changer for me in terms of career. Yeah. But you know, I think about that in terms of okay, so that this is on like a real meaty wave of consequence. But yeah. the other version of that is you're in a heat in less serious waves, but you need like a eight point seven nine and there's 30 seconds left. And I've watched you do this many, many times where you're calm and and you're cool and you're and you're able to do that thing in the dying seconds. And I mm. think about it and I and I look at it as you've done it many times before. And so similarly to that super late takeoff and just getting under the lip and your everything being in check, it's like there's a level of confidence that's like superhuman confidence that I see in in great athletes and which you've done a lot of. But is it a kind of um, positive reinforcement thing where you've done it so many times that you sort of know that like, oh, there's, you know, there's just a few seconds left and something is going to come to me and I'm not going to choke. I'm not going to freeze up. Like I'm maybe gonna... there's maybe a little bit of that, but there's also each situation is different mm -hmm. and each mm -hmm. each situation you're at a different place in your life and there's a different consequence to the to the numbers playing out on the tour and the rankings and all that kind of stuff. Um, if you've never won a contest before and you need that score. Yeah. That's a lot more intimidating than if you've already, you know, if you're Tiger Woods and you've won the Masters six times and you need to birdie the last hole. Yep. Well, I got to put it on the line. I can't be stressed about it. I know what I have to do. So there's, it depends on the situation mm -hmm. is what I'm getting mm -hmm. at. So 
um, I had a heat against Kong in 94 at Bells in the semifinals, and he had me on the ropes, and I needed like a high seven or something, maybe a seven five or an eight even, with about two or three minutes left, and he had priority. And this wave came, and it was a mid-size wave, but the tide was kind of low, so it had some, it stood up, you know? Mm. And um, maybe the waves were like, the biggest waves were probably five feet that day, and it was like a, yeah, maybe a four-footer, three, four-footer. Mm -hmm. And he looked at it and kind of balked and didn't go, and I went, and I got an 8.67, hmm. and I beat him. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, I had done that to Elgo a couple times, um, then Kong. Mm -hmm. So the situation for me wasn't dire. I mean, I wasn't expected to win bells i hadn't done well at bells before yep. and i'm against kong who is supposed to beat me there so the pressure's off me yes so it depends on the pressure too yeah and then sometimes the pressure can can actually it can get to you or it can you know bring you up yeah it can, can yep. bolster what you're doing and yeah that's probably what happened with me and andy at j bay that time mm -hmm. where i got the score in the final minute like mm -hmm. if you go watch that heat right now that wave I got wasn't the score wasn't wasn't a nine point one, but relative to what had happened in the heat, it was right. And relative to the other waves we had ridden, I, the scoring was all too high in the heat. Uh -huh. And Andy's waves were both pretty average. Kind of, he just rode them. Yeah. He didn't do anything special on them. In fact, it was weird in that heat because Andy was talking to me, and he kept telling me how um, how he had cramps in his lower legs and how tired he was. Mm -hmm. And he kept telling me, and I don't know why he kept telling me, he kept bringing up, man, cramps in my legs. And I'm like, that's so weird. And he just usually growls at me or tells me to fuck off. I don't know why he's telling me this. And to me, it kind of exposed this weakness. Huh. You don't think it was a kind of psych, psych out? I don't think he was trying to psych me out. He huh. was really tired. Uh -huh. I know he was. I think he just didn't put enough hyd uh, hydration in his body that day. Okay. And we had surfed, I think we surfed four heats that day. And so we were both really tired. And I was, I was equally as tired. I was dead. Like you could see it on my legs on the last wave. I was so tired, but I was like, I'm not going to let it show. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to push through and see what I can do. But if you if you look back at those waves, I, I think I fairly won the heat, mm -hmm. but I think the scoring was too high. Yeah. And so I shouldn't have needed a 9-1 or whatever I needed. I should have probably needed like a 7-5 or an 8, mm -hmm. and I, I got that. Mm -hmm. And um, relative to what had been done, I, I got that. Because I Andy had two sort of sets. I had like a medium-sized set. And then the biggest set. Yeah. So I had the smaller and the bigger wave. Yep. And he had the two medium ones. And on those waves, he just kind of rode them. Mm -hmm. He didn't do anything crazy. Mm -hmm. My smaller wave, I actually rode really well. I did a nice tail throw. I really pushed into my turns. I wrote, I did a lot of different variety, but the wave wasn't up to the standard of his waves. Yeah. Yep. So it was really like, you, it, it was almost like um, the heat I had with Mick at Bells where I did the big air. Uh -huh. And then I needed an eight point, I think I needed an 8.33 to beat Mick. And I kept getting an 8.17, hmm. like two or three times. Mm -hmm. But um, the the surfing I was doing on those waves just wasn't clean. Just mm -hmm. wasn't my, mm -hmm. I was riding this epoxy board that I had just waxed up for the final. Mm -hmm. I think I mm -hmm. damaged my other one or I didn't like it or something. And it just didn't hold the rail and carve the way I wanted it to. And so I, I felt like I was doing a lot of, like I'd set the turn and push the tail. I wasn't drawing a rail line. And Mick was really drawing these nice rail lines and, comboing the flow mm. better much better than i was um but i did have the chance to do the bigger maneuvers because like i did that air and mm -hmm. the board was really good for that but yep. it wasn't great for carving it was a little too on top of the water uh -huh. and um you know that was a time where i i couldn't get that wave and i've had those times where i can feel it and i know i don't even have to stress at all i'm like it's 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 in my it's in the bag mm -hmm. i got it mm -hmm. like the year i won pipe but Mick won the world title, mm -hmm. 2013 maybe, and I made the final with John. And um, I, I was, I had a lot of anxiety because I was super excited. Mm -hmm. I wasn't nervous. It was just like I wanted to get in the water because I knew what I was going to do out there. Yeah, I was like, I, I knew waking up, especially that last morning. I, I just told myself, I'm going to do my job. I'm going to win this contest. And it's all like that's that's the only control I have today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then Mick got past CJ, and then he got past Yaden. Um, that's one I would contend. I think Yaden smoked him hmm. by more than a point, mm -hmm. um, and that would have given me a world another world title. Uh -huh. But then I look back at other um, titles that I've won, um, and there's definitely a few that I just like things just went everything went my way for me to possibly get the chance to win yep. against Danny Wills and. Um, 
it was in 98. Danny Wells and Mick Campbell mm -hmm. in 98. I remember that year, yeah. Um, and then against Sonny and, and Rob at Pipe in 95. Mm -hmm. Those two years, there's a million things that could have not gone my way, and they all did. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so for that day with Mick to not go my way, I was like, you know, I've been given so much. Yeah, I want that world title. I feel like my hand's on the trophy. Yeah. I had this crazy thing. Um, Sean Doherty? Sean Doherty, yeah. Yeah, Doherty. Yep. Sean called me, and we were doing this interview, and it was right before Pipe. And I'm sitting in L.A., and you know how, you know how bright it is in L.A. in the sky? You don't see any stars or anything. And he's, you know, do, he's interviewing me and Mick in the lead-up to, to the Pipe contest and the world title. And he says to me, what do you think is going to happen at Pipe? And I just like, I was so excited. I was, I was so ready for Pipe that year. And as I started to say the first word, a huge shooting star went across the sky. Wow. Like at San Pedro, Long Beach. Just like, just over the coast. Jeez. Like the brightest one I've ever seen in my whole life. Like I, it looked like a firework, like hmm. it exploded. And I went, Sean, you're not going to believe what just happened as I started to answer He's like, what? I go, this shooting star. I go, as you ask me, what's going to happen at Pipeline? A freaking shooting star. I'm like, if that's not some kind of <laughs> universal message, yeah. I'm like, I don't know yeah. what's, I go, something fucking special is going to happen at Pipeline. Yeah. That's yeah. what's going to happen at Pipeline. Yeah. And he's like, are you kidding? And I go, no, look it up. And we both looked it up in the paper and it was reported. No kidding. Yeah. It, it was so bright. So many people in LA saw it. Wow. And it was so weird, the timing, you know, and that's mm. where you, that's where I look at life and I go, man, there's something. I think the universe is like, I think we all fit in and it's built around all of us mm -hmm, somehow. Mm -hmm. I think there's something going on that none of us can comprehend. Yeah. In fact, I know there is. Um, sometimes we get caught up in the weeds of like problems in life or disagreements with people or, or uh, misunderstandings. And, and it's hard to connect to that. But I really truly believe that everyone has a real purpose in this life. Yeah. And we, we just have to each connect with it. Yeah. It's each, it's, it's individual to each of us. Yes. But it all fits together as a collective. It's as, if, it's as if each of us are a cell in a body. Yeah. And we're all part of that body. And we yeah. all need to do our job. Yeah. No, I, <laughs> I like that a lot. And I think a big thing is um, paying attention. And it's easy to, to stop paying attention. But when you talk about those kind of divine moments, right? Like the shooting star. Um, they're, they're out, I think once, you, once you're attuned to them and once you sort of listen and, and to some degree... Um, are aware that there are bigger forces at work. Mm. They, they're there. The, you could, those signposts are, are are there to sort of guide yeah. us along. Earlier, and you and you have to you. Sorry, no. before you change the subject, but for the average person, I don't know if everyone thinks on the deepest of levels. I tend to be like an overthinker. I'm an overthinker right? for sure. So, so, but when things hit me, they're like they're just so clear. Oh, yeah. I don't even have to think about that. That's yep. obvious. Yeah. And I feel like there's a lot of people who. You know, just like can compare to cells in the body, there's some cells that are just going about doing their business. There's other ones that are out to kill you, mm -hmm. and there's other ones that are cleaning the mess up. And there's other, you know, every every cell's got its own job, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we're cells. You know, we yeah. each got our own job, and yes. some of us are kind of floating along, just just carrying something from here to there, or you know, oh, I'm yeah. a red blood cell and I got some oxygen, <laughs> <You know? laughs> and then other yeah. people, I'm a white blood cell. I got to kill that fucking thing over there, <laughs> yeah. and I, here's yeah. a, some other thing. I got to clean that thing up and and uh, scour the blood and cleanse it through the kidney or whatever. Yeah. And um, so, and and there's just a, a trillion different things going on inside your body, and mm -hmm. there's a trillion different people, there's billions of people on this earth, and we all have something we can add or detract from. Yeah. In this world, and and um, and at any given time, people can kick in and get in that, get on that road, get on yeah, that channel sure. and, and realize that they have a bigger opportunity than they've given themselves mm -hmm. and that they're more important to this life than they've uh, equated themselves as being. Yeah, for sure. Do you meditate? Uh, I do a little bit. Yeah, I generally do um, when I'm going to go to bed. Mm -hmm. I should in the morning. And, you know, I like what Tom's doing, Tom Carroll. I love I love how yeah. Tom gets up every day and he does a meditation with everybody. In case you want to do it, it's five thirty a.m. Sydney time every day yeah. on Tom's Instagram, and it's and uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know if we're going to talk about other stuff too, but um, that you know, Tom's been like a big brother to me, and what he's been through and gone through and been honest about, yeah, is just incredible. No, no Tom Carroll's been a big brother to me as well, and what he's a great example because I think he's a guy who you know he achieves so much as a surfer. 
and he was he was such a huge star in Australia. Yeah. And um, and when it ended, it's almost as if like you know his his neurotransmitter bursts were used to something so high, and and he couldn't uh, he wasn't getting it by winning contests anymore. No, and he no. went he went a he went a bad direction, which he's very. But he was also doing that while he was competing he, too. You he know, was. So the drugs and the, he the was. Whole, you know, so it was a double high. Yeah. But I'll tell you a quick Tom Kell story, which is really funny. I was in Paris in 94 for like two weeks. I'd flown up there to go and potentially do some work with this modeling agency mm-hmm. that had approached me. And, and they flew down to Biarritz, Biarritz to meet me. And they're like, come to Bar- Paris after you're done with the competitions. And it turns out the woman was was good friends with um, Belly okay. and with Morris Cole. Okay. And um, her name is Anne. And so Anne invited me up there. And I had never been to Paris like, before you know so Morse is like oh, i'll come up there with you i know Anne and blah blah blah. i end up staying for like two weeks and sort of towards the end of my trip we, we went to this nightclub to go have a couple drinks and when i went out that night i was like okay i'll bring enough money to where i can have a couple drinks i had been traveling with shane dorian and shane had this huge infatuation with helena christensen okay and she worked for the same molly agency that brought me up there uh-huh so i said oh is helena ever here because Shane and I had drawn these pictures of her, and I was like, I want to get her to sign it. And they go, well, she's never here this time of year, but you can leave it here, and when she's here, we'll get her to sign it, you know. So I was like, okay, cool. So this night I go out with my buddy to get have a couple beers. I'm like, I'll take 40 bucks. I can probably have three or four beers and have a nice night, you know. Slow night. There's no one around at this place, so we're kind of bored. And he's like, I'm going to go home. I go, let's just have one beer, and we'll, I'll, I'll probably kick out too. And I went and bought us two beers, and with forty dollars, I didn't have enough for a third beer. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, "That's you know, like there's these Paris tiny little expensive. these tiny Heinekens, and they were like fourteen bucks a beer." Uh-huh, uh-huh. And so I, I was learning the hard way in Paris, you know. But all good. So we finished our beer, and he goes, oh, "I'm going to go home." I go, "Okay, I'm going to go to the restroom. I'll come back and see you, and and I'll say bye." So I run up the stairs, and I come back down the stairs, and Helena Christensen walks in. I'm like, "Whoa!" And she's with a friend of mine, mm-hmm. the from this modeling agency. Okay, and. And, um, and then in walks Bono and um, Michael Hutchins, mm-hmm. who she's dating at the yep, time. Yep. And I wanted to say hi to Helena and ask her to sign this thing, but I didn't want to go straight up to her, you know, because I yeah. didn't want to disrespect him. Sure. So I went up to Michael, because I was a huge NXS fan. My first concert I ever went to was NXS. Uh-huh. And I went straight up to Michael and I go, hey, Michael, how you doing, man? My, my name's Kelly. I'm a surfer from, from uh, Florida. And he's all, oh, hey, Kelly, surfer. And just kind of like writes me <laughs> off. <laughs> and and I remember when Tom Carroll in about 83, Tom had come to Cocoa Beach and did this promo and they had this little video out on him after he won the world title, 83, 84, I don't know. And he had a clip with Michael Hutchins. Yeah, I remember right? that. Yes. And and they were like broing out at the beach. At, I think they were at Newport, the car park or something. Yeah. Yeah. And so I just went, oh, he's kind of, and I was kind of bummed. I was like, oh, Hutchins, I, I love this guy, but he's kind of being a dick. And I grew up on his music. And then I go, oh, I go, hey, I'm really good friends with Tom Carroll. And he's like, instantly, he just came out of character and was like, oh, my God, I love Tom <laughs> Carroll, mate. He's like, he's the best, mate. He's, he's just a good guy, mate. And, and he, he goes, hey, come and have drinks with us all night. And so I just sat with him and drank, got, got drunk with him all night. It was hilarious. <laughs> Tom Carroll street cred. But yes, Tom Carroll street cred. He just like instantly was like hugging me. Hey, Bono, this is Kelly. You know, <laughs> <laughs> That's so it's hilarious. Good. As a side note, I told Helena, I said, hey, I left this painting at the at the agency and maybe you could sign it and and she goes only if you'll sign a picture for me and I was like great oh wow I'm like what kind of picture you want like a, a surf picture where she goes she leans over on my ear and she goes Kelly it's not the size of the wave it's what you do on it that counts <laughs> like really sexy in my ear it was so funny man I was just <laughs> like so oh good. my god I can't wait to tell <laughs> Shane this story because Shane was like like I thought she was beautiful, but Shane was like really like he was. She was his favorite supermodel, and all I could think of was I, I can't get to a phone quick enough and tell Shane this story. You know, <laughs> that's, that's so funny. <laughs> um, yeah, but Tom, you know Tom Carroll. It's interesting because he was clearly a champion on the surfboard. We we know that. Mm. And then sort of post career, we watched him go through a lot of stuff. And then it's like he's come back around, and he. I have such immense respect for him, and I just love him as a person. Yeah. Tom's been really instrumental in my career and in my personal life. Yeah. In a lot of ways. And um, I mean, he's really, truly been a brother to me. And I didn't realize the extent of, you know, I traveled with Tom and Ross and those guys for years. Dave McCauley, Boothie, mm-hmm. the Quicksilver team. Yes. I did not ex- I did not understand the extent of Tom's drug problems. I, didn't, I had no idea. And he came to me one day in Sydney 
in Avalon. He came over to my house and he's like, he was crying. He's like, Kelly, I need to talk to you. He goes, I'm a, I'm a, I'm an addict and um, I'm trying to get sober. And I was like, whoa. Mm. It's like I had no idea. I just thought you like partied sometime. You know, mm-hmm, I just, mm-hmm. I didn't know. I mean, everyone on that tour partied when I got. Yeah, I was sure. like, the only, me and Greg Anderson were maybe the only sober guys. No, I don't I, know. I know I was part of that generation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and. Um, I was like, it's me and one or two Christian guys that don't drink, but it, or don't, you know, I had a couple of drinks here and there, but I didn't do anything. Yeah, I never yeah. smoked a joint. I never did any kind of drugs, you know, and and I was so blown away because Tom really hid it from me. Mm. He didn't want me to be exposed to it. Yeah, that's so respectful for a yeah. young guy. And he was really, he never tried to like force it on me or even, at, he never even asked me because he mm. knew where I stood, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, Ross, same way, you know, all those guys, anyone who was like partying back then, no one, no one ever, when I was a young guy, young rookie, mm-hmm. they, look, these guys are getting paid to go travel the world and like pick up girls and whatever, you know? Yep. I mean, Tom had a family and was having kids. Yes. Um, but most of the guys were like single, traveling the world. And, um, you know, most of the guys, if they, if they didn't have their wives, they didn't care anyways. They were just yeah. like, I'm in this, I'm in Lockheed now for four days. Cool. I'll do yeah. whatever the hell I'm going to do. Yeah. And it was a, it was a whole different world. Absolutely. It was wild. There was no social media. There was no, there's no connection around the world, you know? Yeah. There's no, no news going out that day. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, no, I think about those times, and I think of as a kid who grew up with surfing, God, that wood chipper is insane, but there's it's nothing so insane, we can do. Yeah. But but growing up, looking up to these guys. We could up, go pay them. We could pay the wood chipper to stop, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but I had so many heroes in the surf world. And then as I got closer, they, I, I feel like there was a lot of examples I wanted to follow, and there were a lot of cautionary tales yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and some of the cautionary tales perfect wood um, chippers dying yeah and turning it off some of the cautionary tales were people that i thought were my heroes but once i got in close enough i realized that's not where i want to go Dude, i was so let down when i got on tour and i went out at club 15 and saw what everyone was doing i was like oh my god yeah I mean, there was this club in hospital you know club 15 and yep. Yep. we were all jet lagged anyway so everyone was going to go out yeah you know you get to france and yeah. you can't sleep so yes. everyone was like oh we're going to rock food oh we're going to club 15 and then it was nothing to be up till six in the morning all yeah, the time. And yeah. guys are raging going straight to heats. And I was like, oh my gosh, how do they do this? I'd be drinking. I, I didn't drink back then. Uh-huh. Um, you know, I would, I would, I wouldn't even have one beer. Yeah. Like the whole trip. To, I wouldn't have a single beer through Europe. That's impressive. And, and then, then it became like, it became almost like a mantra for me. Cause I was like, oh, oh, this is easy. These guys are hammered. They want to what they're doing tomorrow. They're hungover or still drunk or high or whatever. And I was like, I'm I'm gonna have a coke or two, yeah. Because I want like I'm like looking for looking at some cute girls, and I'm you know I'll stay up with my friends and listen to some music, and it was kind of fun to jump in that DJ booth because everyone was yeah, uh, just raging, that. yeah. But um, yeah, I just went oh this this fits into my equation because these guys are not were nowhere close to as prepared as I am for sure, and yeah. But there was a real clear delineation because I was part of that period that that generation of Tom Curran, Tom Carroll, Martin yeah. Potter, etc. Yeah. And I really think when you guys came on the what quote unquote the men, momentum generation yeah, in the yeah. early 90s, you guys were surfing in a way that was it was almost like serving us our our walking papers. It was kind of like these guys are actually doing stuff. There was a sort of like the reverse, I thought of yeah, as a tail trick. slide, yeah, into reverse, yeah, yeah. And, and and the generation that I came from, we were stuck in these kind of like we were we we're stiff in our in our pushing on the tail on the top turns, yeah. And that era that you came in, it was all against clean water. Uh-huh. Whereas we were like, we really liked a coping lip where you could get a little air, or you could let the tail loosen and go backwards. And yeah, <laughs> there was a looseness that you guys had that we didn't. But in many ways, and I'm not, I'm not necessarily drawing a correlation, but that era that I was a part of, and I stopped doing the tour in '91. That whole year, everyone went out with a bang, and there was a lot of partying. I mean, no one. A lot. It was like we the athletic, the serious athleticism that I feel, uh, you know, Tom Carroll, Tom Kern brought to the sport pots mm. as well. There was also like a, a shadow side where there was a lot of partying. Not in the case of Tom Kern, but in Carroll pots, etc. Yeah. And all the guys I knew, it was like a badge of honor to party really hard and to go, you know, do pull an all nighter and surf your heat the next yeah, morning and win a contest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think your your group that was that uh, there's a lot of aussie pressure on that totally you know that whole crew uh, yeah that was all around sarge and stuff yep you know like he really like it was almost like he wanted to be on the f- like like coaxing everyone into mm. that you know yeah. it was a really yeah, yeah. weird there's such a weird energy that was going on there and and you were seen as just like a, a less than a, you know a, a lesser than average citizen if you didn't go yeah oh you haven't raged with the boys you haven't bought us beers you haven't yeah. you know whatever the kind of mateship yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um 
Yeah, interesting. That was a weird pressure. And see, I didn't have a bunch of people on tour when I, the first year I traveled around was in 90. I, I did a few contests through mm -hmm. California and Europe, but mm -hmm. then I had to come back and go to school my final year. Yep. But there was no, Amer all my American crew were, they were all younger than me or not made it on tour yet. And um, so I was the first guy to make it on tour. And I think Taylor was, Taylor Knox was next and then Shane and Rob and all them straight away. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't have a crew. So I was traveling with Pally and Herring and Sarge and um, that whole, yeah. that whole kind of crew, yep. Yep. Um, Sonny Aberton. Yep. Um, we, and it was, I had a lot of fun, you know, we had, we had a good time. We, we did some fun trips like to Indo and through France and stuff. Um, Todd Prestige, mm -hmm. um, was a good friend of mine. Todd and I were like inseparable at times. Um, but then when all my guys got on tour, I was just traveling with them yep. and that was, that was fun. So it was like, it did become us against Aussies. It really was like yep. distinct. You're, you're, you're in one camp or the other. And I was, I liked it because I was friends with both, you know, mm -hmm. but there was, there was a lot of, there was a lot of friction between some of them. Like Elkerton hated the younger guys and he hated the Americans. Mm -hmm. So it was always a thing. So it became this, it became this thing for all of us that we all just wanted to smash Elko and Heats. Mm -hmm. We're like, just fuck that guy. Yeah. You know, you got it. Like he was target number one because he was such an ass to all of us, uh -huh, uh -huh. you know, at least uh -huh. subconsciously or like right. in, in print. Yeah. Um, it, it became this like our badge of honor was let's smoke that guy. Yeah, you know? sure, sure. Um, thinking of the he heroes now, who are your heroes at, 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 at age 49? Gosh, like surf heroes. I don't know. I mean, no, just heroes in general, I think. Yeah. There's that guy, Glenn Calkins, I mentioned earlier, who's cool. Cause he's 67 and he just turned 68. You know, the guy can stand there on one foot and put his foot straight up in the air with his, his leg next to his ear, you know, mm -hmm. I'm like, that is so cool. This guy have stretched himself out and he's gotten so strong. Um, I really, Tom Carroll always, you know, Tom's been such an inspiration on so many levels, but the fact that he came out and wrote a book and divulged all of his everything, you know, yeah. to, you know, cleanse himself honestly makes you humble, you know? Yeah. Um, you can um, tell the truth and be a dick, mm -hmm. you know, but mm -hmm. like when you're honest about yourself and vulnerable, yep. like it really makes you humble and it, it changes your life. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I don't have like the hero worship mm. like I had when I was a kid, mm -hmm. uh, but I still, I still look to, I, I really enjoy watching certain people surf. Mm -hmm. Um, it makes me happy watching Mason Ho surf. Oh you yeah, know? so yeah, wow. and and I really love the lines that Ethan Ewing draws. Me too. And the the imagination of um, Felipe and Italo, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, the dominant, the dominance that um, Gabriel has competitively, incredible, is wild in this in this day and age. Yep. Um, because on natural talent alone, I sort of think like Felipe is better. He's just so dynamic mm -hmm. and oh mm -hmm. my God, you, know, you don't know what he's going to do, even though you've seen him do it all. Yeah. You still don't know what he's going to throw out next. Yep. But, but Gabriel's got that mind for it. You know, he's just got that, he's got that other thing where you go, okay, you got to sort of shoot him in the leg. You yeah. got to pull a Nancy Kerrigan, no, I, you know, to beat the guy. So fierce, yeah. And, um, and then John John, it, it's just so, so refreshing to see a person who's so nice to people, who is um, really truly a humble soul and, He's so good in all conditions mm -hmm. and, and at all types of surfing, yeah. you know, carving or airs or barrels yeah. or big waves or tiny waves. And he wants it. It's not like he's not forcing himself to go in big waves. He loves big waves. Yeah. Yep. And, um, and he's really, he's just really focused. Everything his whole life is surf mm -hmm. and no wonder he's so good, but growing yeah. up on the beach here and everything, but he's, it's great. It's really great surfing. You know, any sports need people like, all of those guys. Yeah, I love with Ron, with John John. You know, there's there are all these sort of technical things that he's very proficient at. But the that frontside car, which is such a sort of timeless maneuver, and he mm -hmm. just does it it's further. It's bring it further back and further in the mm. steep and more kind of gravity defying. It's yeah, so I think, beautiful. I think him and Paisel have really worked to get to a board that draws a line that fits John and fits the waves he rides. You Absolutely. Know? And, yeah. And it looks like they've figured out the rocker and template combination yeah to to fit where he imagines the arc yeah for sure you know and um it's really cool it's really cool to see yep yeah. is there something like that a, a feeling or a kind of part of the wave or a, a maneuver that that you're most that you're excited about right now like what um 
you know, as we do, you go surfing and then you come in and there's like, it's it's still washing through you. There's like that afterglow and you, mm-hmm. you're kind of feeling things. Is there something that you've been really psyched on lately? I haven't been surfing lately. Uh-huh. <laughs> I surfed. I honestly, I surfed. Um, well, I did one trip down to Mexico for a week and surfed with Shane and Jackson. So I was surfing every day there. Uh-huh. But I got there going, man, I've hardly surfed at all since since the contest in Mexico in August. Mm-hmm. So I didn't surf much at all in September, a little bit in October, uh, mostly just in Mexico. And then I went home to Florida and between the first week of November and getting here to Hawaii, I think I paddled out six times. Hmm. Um, and I t- it was about a three to four week period I didn't surf at all. So I actually like taking that time off sometimes. Yeah. I have gotten to Hawaii before doing five weeks without riding a wave. Um, I've gone to competitions. I, I remember going to in 06, I got to Mexico. I hadn't surfed in weeks. And I got wow. to Chopo and I hadn't surfed in weeks. So, um, but you're clearly but doing a lot of physical fitness that's not surfing. Usually wave. body work. Not not a lot of working out. I like I just like to poor man's yoga, get time massage, you know. Yep. And kind of, yeah. you know. There, but there's something, there's something different to you doing it yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, I, and I work with hyper ice and I have my hyper volt and I massage and stretch and that kind of stuff too. But I could definitely go next level with it to get myself in a, a different notch category of shape. I'm actually the heaviest and most out of shape I've ever been right now. Hmm. Um, like COVID weight, you know, mm-hmm. no, but mm-hmm. I'm like 10, 12 pounds heavier than I was a year ago. Hmm. I got to Hawaii the other day, like five, six days ago. And I surfed like four straight hours to Haleiwa and I, you know the paddling out there yeah that's a f- i got home that night and my shoulder completely locked up and i went to see porter turnbull the next day and he's like yeah you got a rotator cuff tear hmm. and i go how long is that and he's like that's like six weeks man wow and i'm like fuck but you so, can you can still compete at pipe in, in well no it, he thought it was a tear because okay. i couldn't lift my arm out more than about five or six inches from the side of my body Jeez. and um so it was locked up for like two days but the second day I got a, f- a friend of ours came over, did acupuncture on it. Mm-hmm. And she just, it was crazy, man. She, she put needles in and, um, did a couple things. And then she was working these other points on my other leg, the opposite leg. And she said, there's a gallbladder point or this or whatever. And she's, she's like, try to lift your arm. And I was trying, I couldn't lift my arm and she pushed on this point and I was able to lift my arm all the way wow. up. Wow. And it, that Incredible. was really cool because it was instant feedback. Uh-huh. And, um, and uh and i was doing it wasn't that muscle testing stuff you know like yep. sometimes that can be like did he really push that hard sure, on, on sure. your hand you know yeah and and uh <laughs> but I, like i woke up the next day like the first night i did it, i couldn't sleep i was in so much pain like i had a terrible sleep i had a sleep score of like 50 on my aura ring 55 mm-hmm. and then the next night i didn't even notice it when i was sleeping and mm-hmm. then Second day, I thought it was going to be six weeks. And like two days into it, I'm like, oh, I might be able to surf almost today. Hmm. And then on the third day, I actually surfed, which was two days ago. Wow, that's great. Um, and then yesterday, I went and hit some golf balls. So hmm. I'm like, that's kind of the test. Mm-hmm. But so uh, I got lucky. It was just kind of like, okay, settle into this thing. My, I guess the point is I didn't surf for a long time. Yeah. And I, I got here and I'm like, okay, I'm going to burn as many calories as I can. I'm going to surf as hard as I can all day. Mm-hmm. And I came in that night and I couldn't use my arm anymore. Kalani's like, yeah, well, maybe ease into it a little bit. Mm-hmm. Maybe don't go 100 percent like mm-hmm. day one. Mm-hmm. So, but I'm just getting to Hawaii, having not surfed much for a few months. Getting here is like so inspiring because the waves are fun and good. And I guess the feeling that's exciting to me is I grabbed I grabbed this old board that I made with Greg Weber. That I had a brand new board that's seven years old. I never rode six years old and I, I wrote it at Hollywood and the board isn't the, the balance in it isn't good. It's a little too wide for me. Mm-hmm. And the foil is a little, it's a little too thick in the nose and thin in the center. So the, the balance of the board isn't right for me. Yep. And, and I don't like a real wide board cause I don't like to step side to side. I want to be like in my spot in uh-huh. the middle of the board, uh-huh. but the board was so smooth and, and flowy between turns and it was so exciting to feel that. So now I'm like really inspired for, for, um, working on some boards on the computer and um, trying to maybe whip out a couple things before pipe next week even. And then just the excitement of not being bored of, if I had been here for six weeks, I wouldn't be that inspired and, yeah. and up every day, yep. you know? Yep. So it, that excitement when you get to Hawaii, remember when you're a little kid, you come to Hawaii the first time and you're like, you can't sleep that first night, sure. take me to pipe, I wanna look at the pipe at pipeline, you know? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's uh, exactly what I had Cackley do for me and Sean the first time we came to pipe. We gotta go and look at it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, so it, it's having time off 
really helps helps me to be um, get excited about it. Mm-hmm. And as far as inspiration, I don't know. There's some people I follow online that that inspire me. That talk. It can be business or working out or jujitsu or whatever. Mm-hmm. And people who are just kind of like masters of their mind or their craft. Yeah. That um, help kind of because if you hear somebody's approach to something else that even that you don't do, you can apply it to yourself. And, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I as a writer, you watching you surf is. I've I've tuned into like a a, a webcast of an event. And I've had work to do that day, and I've watched great surfing, you doing it, and others. And it's sort of like, oh, this is how I want to write, you know. And it's actually surfing, mm-hmm. but it's just, it's just being, it's just communicating. Yeah, it's like know? hearing a song. Expression. That just, all the lyrics and all the chords make, and and the beat, like everything fits together just right. And the production, yeah. you know, that that drum came in at the right time. That bass was just at the right volume, you know. Yeah. yeah. And and uh, you know the right the right chorus pedal or whatever kind of pedal on the on the chorus for uh, for, for the song and the guitar. But when when all those elements come together at the right time, you feel like it just was it was already written. Yeah. You just had to put it down. Yeah. You know? Sure. Yeah. yeah. And yep. I'm sure that you you must get if you. If you're in that place where you choose like writing and, and reading over surfing as, as a level of importance for you, then you must feel that from it where you get in this flow. Oh, like yeah. You can feel what's happening. You can feel it's just writing itself or it's just. Yeah. I think there are real parallels that I didn't see early on because um, one was out in the ocean, you know, with the sky above your head and the other one's in a room sedentary in a chair, basically. Mm. But as having written now for. 30 plus years as as a career um there it, it it's a similar expression it's you, the the lines you draw on a wave and that 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 sense of this is my thumbprint this is who i am mm. this is my self expression and your style of course like that same thing is apparent in writing it's just not it's just not done in a physical way and i have to say like for years i struggled with that because surf pro surfing is like one of the most privileged things ever i mean you get to excel at this thing that is it, um, baked into it is like these this incredible physical fitness and the kind of the rush and the joy mm. and you go and you do the thing that you love and it's also like you know when folks who go to the gym because they have like a desk job and and that's like oh i got to take care of my body like that was never a question for us right like we our physical physical fitness just mm. simply came from yeah. surfing and i didn't realize how lucky and fortunate that was until i stepped out of it and yeah. was oh i've got to write and i've got the default it's just like does it it does it without having to think about it. Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah, and it be, and that also becomes a sort of maybe not an addiction, but a thing that you. I always feel like you know, our, as a former pro surfer, like the level of physical fitness bar is higher than for most people. Like what what I feel shitty in my body if I don't do a lot every single day. You know, mm-hmm. um, where there are other people who have never really tapped into that place. Mm-hmm. That's what you know. When I was saying earlier, there are like there are certain curses that come with having done this for all these years. Mm. I don't know if you brought this up on podcast or not. I was going to ask you about the time you drowned when you were a kid. Oh, yeah. We yeah. can get into that. This was... I don't know if a lot of people know that. Yeah. I, 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 it was, were you with Joey Jenkins? Who were you I was, with? I think Joey Jenkins was out. A few folks. My brother was out. Yeah. It was at Port Wainimi. It was between events on the tour. I was a pro surfer. Yeah. I was sponsored by Rip Curl. It was back when... like I, had, you, I know the story, but I like hearing it okay. again. I think no, people I, will find it interesting. Sure, though. sure. No, and, and um, Rip Curl had a new... There was a new wetsuit coming out, and there were these prototypes that they'd sent to a few of us. And there was also a fire, a forest fire, wildfire in the Santa Monica Mountains. But it was Port Wainimi. The waves were tiny. I paddled out. I was in my competitive mode. I was trying to do all the right things and imagine I was in heat. I was kind of in a dreamy space. I had the Led Zeppelin song, Thank You, in my head, which is kind of a very like somber, you know, kind of sad song. Mm-hmm. And I was in this dreamy place, and then all of a sudden I woke up in the back of an ambulance, and I found out that I'd um, washed up on the beach, completely bloated. They cut me, actually someone performed CPR. On there the, was a firefighter or something on the well, beach, there, right? Yes, it, but he's off duty. It was a dude yeah, that yeah, was yeah. just sitting there, but he was hanging there, out yeah. with his family, I believe. And I don't even know because I remember none of it, but only what I, they've told me. But they, he did it, CPR, saved my life, an ambulance came, I went away, and I remember being waking up in the hospital and there was my wetsuit cut open. But what? And you're like, my suit. Yeah. My suit. <laughs> no, but <laughs> what I, are you guys doing? <laughs> but, but after that, I had an MRI, and there was the possibility that I'd had a seizure. 
But what I found out later was Bryce Ellis, who was also sponsored by Rip Curl, had one of the same wetsuits, and he had a thing where it was too tight on his arm, and he had like this almost a blood clot. An embolism or something. Yeah, like something, yeah, the, yeah. Yeah, huh. whatever that was. And um, blockage. And I remember thinking, okay, the wetsuit was constricting my neck somehow. So it was like these prototype wetsuits that weren't fitting the, well. The level of wetsuit wasn't super high back then. No, <laughs> no. Yeah, they've come a long way. Um, yeah, but that was, that, was, uh, that was a profound moment in my life. Wow. Have you had any uh, serious like near-death brushes? Yeah, I had one like that. I got knocked out. I've, I've been knocked out a couple times surfing, but I didn't take water in either either of them. And I woke up both times and saved myself. Kind of, oh, oh, oh. Mm-hmm. Luckily, my leash hadn't broken or anything, you know? Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, one was when I was 19. I was on a trip with um, Pally and Herring and Prestige and uh, Matt Smith, Sarge, mm-hmm. one or two other guys. And we were in um, Timor. And I was doing a floater on a backside left. And when I came down off the lip, going full speed on about a probably eight foot free fall, Mm -hmm. maybe a little bigger, but yeah, probably say eight foot. I launched out in the flat to my outside rail caught and I just pancaked my head, just slapped it against my temple, hit the water really hard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I got knocked out and I woke up, I think about 25, 30 seconds later. Jeez. And um, my eyes were open the whole time. That's the only thing I remember is I kept seeing light and dark, but I, d- I wasn't conscious. Hmm. I was like in the twilight zone. Mm-hmm. And then I, this thought popped in my head, oh, I should probably come up. Like, I should probably wake up. Wow. Maybe I should wake up and go up. And I woke up and I hit the service, surface. And um, this guy, Matt Smith, who unfortunately passed away years ago, um, he was on the next wave. and he Not the next wave. He's on two waves behind it. He said he let the next one go. And as I came up, he almost hit me. And I went into that wave and I paddled in the channel, just went into crazy, uh, went into crazy shock. And hmm. I had amnesia for about 12 hours. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. Um, well, Kelly, it's been great talking to you. Yeah, you too, man. And uh, happy birthday, you, you, the big five zero. Um, yeah. You know, in 2008, I thought I was going to retire like in 2010. Mm-hmm. And I remember even then people saying, you know, there was always those murmurs. Look, in 2000, I got off the tour in 99. 99, 2000, 2000, 2001. And in 2002, Surfing Magazine did an article with Taj and Andy and Dingo and Parco and all these guys and basically kept me out of it. Mm-hmm. And we're like, who's the next guy to take, o- you know, take win a world title? Like, mm-hmm. who's the next guy to be the guy? And I didn't get it. I literally didn't get a mention in there. Okay. And so I think, um, I think they just, because no one over 30 had ever won a world title. Mm-hmm. You know, no one over maybe upper 20s had never yeah. won a world title yep. and um i might have been one of the older ones at 26 i think maybe derek was a 28 I'm not, I'm not positive on that but um so i think they would just thought oh well he's not gonna be a factor when he comes back because mm-hmm. i'll be 30 or you know i was gonna be 30 the year i got back on tour so i never thought 20 years later i'd be here and you know, i thought maybe i'd have a little run yeah. try to win another world title yep and then i won five uh, when I, I won five more yeah. At that point. So, yeah. Yep. Um, and I was close a couple of times, you know, with Parco, with, 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 uh, with Mick and, um, we had a lot of competitive years, but I, I, I think at some point this thing felt a little bit more than me mm-hmm. because I started noticing how many people felt inspired because I was 40 or I was 43 or yeah. I was 46. Yep. And they're like, no way that I'm younger than you. And I feel old and I, I've been slacking. So, yeah. you know, I, I, there were a lot of people I've gotten messages from over the years that were like, man, you got me up off my butt and I'm doing stuff now and I'm yeah. playing with my kids and I'm surfing again. I quit surfing and I'm back in the water. And um, I think there's some things that are just like sort of bigger than us. You know, it just sends a message. It's not about me at all. It's just sending a message that they can do it too. Yeah. And I think that's why, you know, athletes are important. Yeah. Um, they, they, yeah, of course, like in their primes, guys like M- Michael Jordan can do these crazy things that inspire everybody. But, um, you know, if you don't have if you don't have this sort of message that's bigger than your own self desires mm-hmm. and you're kind of wasting that mm-hmm. fame, you're wasting that yep. notoriety. Yep. Cool stuff. Well, should we surf? Yeah, we should <laughs> surf. Yeah. Great chatting, Kelly. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Jamie. Thank you. All right. Soundings is produced by me, Jamie Brissick, and Jonathan Shiflett. You can find it on Apple, Stitcher, and Spotify. 
Our theme song is Ocean Parkway by the Gun Trusinski duo. You can find more of their music on Spotify. Soundings is brought to you by the Surfer's Journal, a reader-supported publication made possible by sponsorship from Birdwell, FCS, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, Bisla, and Yeti. The Surfer's Journal is published six times a year. Along with the magazine, subscribers receive unlimited access to every article from its 30-year archive, as well as members-only access to additional digital content, exclusive film screenings, and sponsor offers. For more information, visit surfersjournal.com. Thanks again for listening to Soundings, and we will see you again. Soundings.